Dr. Ang Eng Hen Sen, Minister for Education and Second Minister for Defense. Professor Wong Feng Wu, Chairman LKY School Governing Board. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. We are gathered here today to mark the fourth anniversary celebrations of our school. Thank you for taking out the time to attend this important lecture. Before we start the formal program, I would like to draw your attention for the next 10 minutes to a documentary that has recently been completed by our school. This documentary highlights the exciting journey and the remarkable progress our school has made in the last four years. The documentary screening will be followed by our Dean's remarks. Thereafter, we will hear from the Minister of Education. The Minister has also agreed to a Q&A session after his lecture. Finally, I am pleased to inform you that the LKY school students and staff are invited for a celebratory lunch in the foyer of the Oi Tiong Ham lobby. I invite you now to view the LKY school video. We hope that you enjoy it and, fi and find it somewhat inspiring. Thank you. economy in the world and growing three times faster than the UK. By 2040, it's predicted that India will boast the world's third largest economy. China's rise, along with that of India and the continuing weight of Japan, represents the greatest shift in global power in history. As countries in Southeast Asia also enter a new phase of development, the importance of public policy and good governance has become increasingly recognized. Despite rapid development, and in part because of it, there are still many challenges that face the region. More than ever before, the continued prosperity of Asia depends on the ability of its politicians and policymakers to provide leadership and sound public policies for the benefit of its people. School of Public Policy, a graduate school of the National University of Singapore, is a place where policymakers come to discuss the vast spectrum of issues that face Asia and the complexities of new governance for this region. It is ideally situated to provide unique perspectives and insights on the emergence of the world's most dynamic region. It was first established in 1992 as the public policy program of NUS in partnership with the John F. Kennedy School of Government of Harvard University. The school is headed by Dean Professor Kishore Mabobani, named as one of the top 100 public intellectuals by Foreign Policy magazine in 2005. The mission of the school uh, is to help Asia transform itself. It's the fastest growing school of public policy in the world. It is also in some ways the most generous uh, school of public policy in the world because uh, only 20% of our students come from Singapore, 80% come from overseas and uh, about 85% of those who come from overseas come from, on scholarships given by the school. But most of the schools of public policy are in the West. We are the first Asian school of public policy to join the Global Public Policy Network that was set up by SIPA of Columbia University and Ivy League University in America, by London School of Economics and by Sciences Po in Paris. Concrete benefit that you get from uh, uh, joining the GPPN is that you can enroll in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy uh, in the Masters in Public Policy program. And if you do well uh, in the first year, you're eligible to go to uh, Columbia University, LSE or Sciences Po. And you can uh, get two degrees uh, instead of one. 
And uh, quite often, if you're a scholarship student, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy pays all your expenses in Singapore and in uh, New York, London, or Paris. And that's a huge gift uh, that the school provides. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy's reputation for excellence lies in its faculty. This diverse and growing community of scholars and practitioners are well known for teaching and research expertise in a variety of fields. Governments across the region are facing increasing performance pressures from, from their citizens. And that's whether you look at it in terms of delivering consistent economic growth, social services, or reducing corruption. I think the LKY school is uniquely poised to be an innovator among schools of public policy. We use case studies systematically from throughout the region and train students to use them to think critically about lessons they could draw and how to translate those across uh, sometimes very messy geographical and cultural boundaries. Most schools focus on quantitative and qualitative analysis and we have a strong emphasis on that to understand the context in which leadership occurs. But to get to the core of the leader and what helps a leader move forward to bring about change, one needs to look at the individual. There's very little research on Asian leadership and on public leadership. And so we're reinventing something here, trying to make it appropriate for Asia. The school also attracts distinguished visitors and guest lecturers, such as former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, New York Times columnist Thomas L. Friedman, Nobel laureate Douglas North, Indian Minister for Commerce and Industry Kamal Nath, and Rwandan President Paul Kagame. For prospective students, the school offers three master's programs. The Master in Public Policy program is a two-year course targeted at young professionals. The Master in Public Administration, a one-year degree, caters to mid-career professionals. And finally, the Master in Public Management, targeted towards senior leaders in the public and private sector, provides the opportunity for qualifying students to spend a semester at Harvard or Columbia University. The school also offers a PhD degree and a diverse range of high-quality executive education programs. These are awarded by the National University of Singapore, consistently ranked among the top universities in the world. Executive education plays a critical role in supporting the school's mission to raise levels of governance around the world. Because the courses are short, because they are targeted at specific organizations and specific countries, it allows us to much better serve the needs of those countries. We're recently engaged in a, a multi-year program catered to the needs of Vietnam. Now this country is undergoing a period of transition. It has just joined the World Trade Organization and its economy is moving from central planning towards free markets. We have been retained by the Asia Development Bank to train up to 900 Vietnamese government officials and prepare them for, these, for the new environment in which they find themselves. The school attracts students from a variety of backgrounds. International concert violinist Min Lee is a Yale University graduate who has performed with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. My previous background and experiences have been very, very different. And I've been performing since I was five and it's been such a focused career that I just really felt I wanted the chance to broaden myself a little, just get a different perspective on things. And I feel that the Lee Kuan Yew School was the perfect opportunity for me to do that. I came here to Singapore because I wanted to get an understanding of the Asian public policy framework. And I feel that the curriculum has enabled me to do that. I have taken a chance to travel around the region um, on our breaks. I've been to some trips to Vietnam, Malaysia, Cambodia, a uh, number of different countries, often traveling with my classmates, which has been a lot of fun. And I've gotten to see places that I never would have seen before. The idea of doing a master's program is to equip you with skills to get a job. My chosen area of interest was public service and I wanted to do something which had practical implications as well as quantitative rigor. So public policy was the perfect choice. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy has also actively pursued the establishment of centers of excellence. These include the Institute of Policy Studies, 
the Asia Competitiveness Institute, and the Center on Asia and Globalization. IPS brings to the school a track record of 20 years of hard work in studying various aspects of Singapore's public policy and the experience of governance. To give you some example, we have done a major book on how we have been able to maintain harmony between our different ethnic groups, our different religions, and, and this harmony is so important to the overall governance of Singapore and to our continued prosperity. The objectives of the Asian Competitiveness Institute is to help the countries in the region uh, develop faster economically by developing policies and implementing policies that will create jobs, attract investments, and hopefully improve the standard of living of the people. There are enormous numbers of studies that look at the impact of globalization on Asia, but we're interested in the looking at the question the other way around. What is Asia's impact going to be on the world, and how are Asian leaders thinking about what their impact ought to be? The center is unique because it is a place that brings together the best scholars from Asia and from the West. We have partnerships with the Brookings Institution, with researchers in Australia, at Princeton University, at Harvard, at Tsinghua University, really all over the world. Upon graduation, the school encourages students to make a difference, not just a living, with many of the school's alumni choosing to take up roles that contribute to improving the lives of people all over the world. The advantage of a public policy education is that you learned about the strengths of the invisible hand in the marketplace, and you also learn about the strengths of the visible hand in governance, and that's something you cannot get in a business school. Our hope is that with the public policy education we're providing, the end result will be that millions, if not billions of lives will benefit. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy is a school for those with the aspiration and drive to make a positive difference to their societies and to the world at large. It is a school that embraces the past to shape the future. A school that creates future leaders. A school that turns ideas into actions. It is the school of New Asia. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I thank you for your attention, and now I'd like to invite our Dean, Professor Mabubani, to come and give his opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Ng Yen Hien, Minister for Education and Second Minister for Defense. Professor Wang Gangwu, Chairman of our Governing Board, uh, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, all of you here on the occasion of the fourth uh, anniversary celebrations, and in particular, I want to thank Minister Ng for gracing this occasion and for agreeing to deliver the lecture today. Now, the school was launched on 16th August 2004, and so we try to commemorate each anniversary with a public lecture. My role here is to give a very short uh, introduction. I normally make three points, as some of you may know. And uh, three points are first uh, about the school, then about the lecture series, and then a note about the speaker. Now, the school, and, and frankly, if I had to give five quick indicators of the growth of the school, the first one, of course, I would mention is the video. I told the minister we just finished it yesterday afternoon at 5 o'clock, by the way, <laughs> just in time. And the reason why we had to produce this video is because we're getting so many visitors to the school, almost daily visitors, we decided that we had to produce a video that told the story uh, in, in a few minutes to everybody. The second indicator of growth is, of course, space. We started, you may not believe this, in August 2004, 
with one floor in one building, Shaw Building in Kentridge. We moved to one building in Hingwi King Terrace, and now we've grown to three buildings in the Bukit Timah campus. And as I told the minister when you're walking in, we are running out of space already. <laughs> and that's true, by the way. So that's an indication of how rapidly we are growing. Third, of course, the students. We started the program that we inherited at less than 40 students in 2004. Today we have 283 students from 43 countries. Uh, so that makes us clearly the fastest growing uh, school of public policy in the world. And we are very proud, as you can tell, of the diversity of background of our students. Fourth is, of course, our faculty in our centers. Uh, our faculty grew from 11 to 25, and it's also very diverse and very strong. And you can see that we started with zero research centers. Uh, I think the film mentioned three. Since the film was done, we have one more, Institute of Water Policy, and we may announce another one next month. So five centers in four years. And finally, of course, we have this wonderful range of partnerships uh, with the Kennedy School, we have the first Asian school to join the Global Public Policy Network. But we also, by the way, have exchange programs uh, with other universities like Tokyo University, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, HEI in Geneva, Tsinghua, and also with Moscow. So the range of partnerships that we have are also growing. In short, the school has made remarkable progress in, in four years. Secondly, let me say a bit about the lecture series. We thought the best way to mark each year is to uh, have a distinguished lecture. And we are very pleased that we have had a very diverse range of speakers. On the first anniversary, we had Pascal Lamy, uh, who was then the Director General Designate of the World Trade Organization, but as you know, now he's running the World Trade Organization. He discussed the lessons that European integration could provide for global governance. On the second anniversary, we had Minister Mao Bautan, who talked about housing policy in Singapore. And on the third anniversary, we had Ms. Zaina Anwar, the Executive Director of Sisters of Islam Malaysia, who shared her thoughts on Islam and public policy. So we are also very proud that in the choice of speakers and topics, we've tried to be very diverse also uh, on these anniversaries. And now this brings me to my final point. I'm happy to say a word about our very distinguished speaker, Minister Ng. Let me begin by emphasizing that he's a graduate of the National University of Singapore. <laughs> uh, he obtained his MBBS in 1982 from our university, graduating with distinctions in social medicine and public health. He subsequently received his Master in Medicine and Surgery in 1987, also from the National University of Singapore. Uh, he then worked as a consultant surgeon in Singapore General Hospital before entering private practice in 1997. He began his political career in November 2001 when he was elected a member of parliament for Bishan Tuapayo GRC and he was appointed Minister of State for Education and Minister of State for Manpower in January 2002. This was followed by a remarkably rapid uh, rise in his political career. In 2003, he became the Acting Minister for Manpower and was promoted to full minister in the following year. In 2005, he was appointed the Second Minister for Defense while continuing to serve concurrently as the Minister for Manpower. He returned to the Ministry of Education in April 2008 as Minister for Education while retaining his defense portfolio. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Ng will be speaking to us on the topic, Educating the Next Generation. It's a particularly appropriate topic to be speaking about in the School of Public Policy. Also because Singapore's track record in education, as we all know, has been quite remarkable. We do actually get a lot of visitors who come to Singapore and come to our school to ask us questions about why Singapore's education system has done so well. Well, there's no better person here to discuss the future of education than Minister Ng. So can I please invite you, Minister, to give the lecture. Professor Wang Kangwu, Chairman of the Governing Board, Kishore, Dean of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. First, let me thank 
the school for inviting me to speak this morning at your fourth anniversary lecture. It's a great honor. As Kishore says, uh, the school has undergone remarkable uh, growth and expansion. Uh, it has occupied a footprint larger than where you are now. I take note of the fact that you're short of space. I'm only speaking figuratively, of course. <laughs> but where you travel, the Kuan Yew School of Public Policy has gained renown. And for a school of four years, is a remarkable achievement. I think it reflects well on the board, the faculty, and the students. I'm a proud alumni, alumnus of uh, NUS Medical School. Uh, it helped when we were doing our postgraduate fellowships, whether it was in Edinburgh, where I'm a fellow, the Royal Salt College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, or in um, US, where we did further postgraduate studies. But it shows the branding and the equity that we get from NUS. I also want to make a note on the choice of your speakers. I'm glad it reflects a strategic perspective. I note that in your second public lecture, you invited the Minister of National Development. And in this lecture, you're inviting the Minister of Education. There are strategic thrusts in these invitations. <laughs> to entitle the lecture, Educating the Next Generation, I think is to invite a torrent of passionate responses and suggestions. Here's one tip for you. If you ever find yourself in a dinner when conversations are getting insipid, just say you're from the Education Ministry. Conversations will liven and all the closet educationists will come springing out. And there will be many opinions, many suggestions, all of which have some kernel of truth and merit. Universally, there is strong interest and commitment to ensure that the young receive a sound education. But in practice, this yearning has not always resulted in approval when new educational initiatives are introduced. In fact, if you look at surveys across countries, the norm is more often than not dissatisfaction with incumbent education systems. Let me cite one instance. This was a 2007 survey by the Fraser Institute, which is an independent Canadian research organization, and 94% of respondents in Ontario, Canada, cited disappointment with their public schools as a factor in choosing and therefore sent their children to a private school. Never been to Ontario. Any here from Canada? I don't know what ails Ontario, but when 94% of the respondents, I presume as a self-selected group, say they're dissatisfied, it cannot be that the system is so bad, but it shows that there is a great mismatch between expectations and results. And even high-performing systems don't always garner approval. So despite South Korea's strong educational achievements in recent years, the IHT reported in June that a rapidly expanding number of Korean parents have been driven, quote, driven by a shared dissatisfaction with South Korea's rigid educational system, unquote, to school their children in English-speaking countries. So they're sending them to New Zealand, the US, and Singapore has also noticed a rising number of Korean students in our schools. Korean par parents believe their children have an edge if they become fluent in English, but also want to escape the, quote, stress of South Korea's notorious educational pressure cooker, as exemplified by their cramped schools. Stakeholders, parents and children themselves included, obviously have high ideals and reasonably expect good public education as a universal right, as enshrined in many constitutions worldwide. But the, the delivery of this right has been patchy. Spending more does not always guarantee better outcomes. As a percentage of GDP, countries like Chile and Mexico spend more on education compared to the OECD average but are not known for high performing educational systems. On the other hand, the cumulative expenditure per student of New Zealand and the Netherlands is below the OECD average 
Yet both are among the best performing countries in OECD's program for International Student Assessment, PISA, surveys. The richest countries don't always have the best quality education systems. The U.S. is the largest economy in the world. They have the best schools in some areas, but even by their own admission, lament the state of their general education system. Last year, some of you may have read that Bill Gates joined forces with fellow philanthropist Eli Broad to launch a U.S. 60 million campaign called Strong American Schools to push for education reforms in public schools. One quip is that the standard of schools in the San Francisco Bay Area rises with the altitude where the more wealthy can afford homes and send their schools there. For sure, successive governments, U.S. governments, have put in resources to try to improve outcomes. So take, for instance, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 in the U.S. to reduce the achievement gap for disadvantaged students. However, seven years later, and after more than U.S. 160 billion spent on this initiative, the results are still inconclusive and the merits are still being hotly debated in the education community up till today. In the UK, independent schools such as Eton, Winchester, Wickham Abbey and Wellington have traditionally been bastions where the elite have sent their children to receive their education for generations. A visiting master from one of these independent schools recently told me that the average spent was about £26,000 a year in these schools which, when compared with that spent in public education, was about twice, slightly twice. To close this gap, the Tory government under Blair and Brown put considerable resources to improve education. The government set the goal for getting 50% of its students into university. But the results, again, have been mixed. The Straits Times recently reported that one of Brit Britain's leading Universities, Imperial College of London, is introducing a new entrance exam for its applicants because it believes that the grades in the present UK A-levels are so inflated that they can no longer provide a viable way to select the best students. So some elite schools and universities want to abandon the UK A-levels to opt instead for a new and more rigorous pre-U qualification offered by Cambridge University. I recently visited the Cambridge University. You may, you may know it by its old name, the University of Cambridge Local Examination Syndicate called Uckles. The name has been changed to Cambridge Assessment. And they're offering a new qualification called Cambridge Pre-U. The examples of these mixed outcomes I've cited are not isolated ones. Unfortunately for many countries, the quest to educate the masses well through a strong public education system has been akin to going through a maze with inaccurate maps or directions. Many have taken wrong turns or landed up in dead ends. The best intent and socialist ideals did and could not translate into practical and effective outcomes for students. And I'm talking about public education. In other words, not the best schools in that system, but the median and how narrow that variance is in terms of its performance. Why is this so? Have we asked too much of education systems? Does the fact that there are fewer systems that do well tell us anything? Pointedly for us in Singapore, how is the Singapore education system fared and how do we improve it further? These are all important questions. And let me give some answers. The Singapore education system is well regarded internationally. I say this with humility and almost with a sigh of relief because we could have easily veered off track, and I, as I will explain later. The International Institute for Management Development, IMD, World Competitiveness Yearbook for this year ranks Singapore first for having an education system that meets the needs of a competitive economy. At the school level, our 14- and 18-year-old students come out top 
in both maths and science among 49 countries in the 2003 Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. This is called TIMS. This will be the only slide I'll show for this lecture, so uh, enjoy it. <laughs> I want to point out what this slide shows. In this era of globalization, one aspect is that international comparisons have been taken across countries in various systems. So this itself is a positive facet of globalization, that you can actually compare across systems, varying cultures, languages, socioeconomic status, and you can rank them. There are a few accepted ones. TIMS is one, as I said, is international uh, trends in international mathematics and science study, and it has 49 countries. So they do the same tests for those age 10 and 14 in all these schools, 949 countries that they survey. Another one is PEARLS that I'll mention, the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study, which basically measures literacy and language. And another, the OECD PIZZA, which I mentioned about. So these three are the more benchmarks. But there are a few interesting results that we should know. I showed this slide to show our top ranking in 2003. So Singapore fortunately ranks up there for 2003. But if you note the leaders in that list, Singapore, Korea, Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei, Japan, Asian countries, no accident. There's something to do with the culture, the emphasis that parents place in education. But I also want you to note another feature, a more important feature, of where our lower or weaker academic students and how they fare and they've blown up that slide on, on the left, and that black line on the top represents the median, as it does in the international average. Basically, our lowest quartile, the weakest 25th percent of our students, do better than the world average. And I said, public education, what is your median and what is your variance? So it's a very key point. In other words, students who are academically weaker in our system do better compared with others. Singapore was also ranked fourth for reading literacy skills among 40 countries, and this was a 2006 Pearl study, the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. This was the highest among non-native speakers who took their tests in English. This was in English. Good universities the world over, recognize that our students are well-schooled and competent and welcome their admissions. Our top students can easily compete with the best anywhere. Sizable numbers enter Oxbridge, Imperial College, LSE, Warwick, and the Ivy Leagues. Raffles Junior College, for example, sends more students to the 10 top U.S. universities than any other international school and even top many prestige, prestigious secondary schools within the U.S. So when I visited Stanford, they said, RJC sends more students to us than any other school, including U.S. schools. The Cornell president said, there's only one problem with Singapore students. I don't have enough of them. <laughs> we have a system that produces high averages, and we top international rankings in maths and science. This is a considerable achievement, considering that in 1980, less than 30 years ago, only about 58% of our primary one students completed secondary school. In other words, 60% didn't complete secondary school. What were the reasons for this dramatic turnaround? If we are to chart future directions, we must first understand the reasons for this success, lest we inadvertently weaken the foundations sustain us as we move forward. What are the reasons for this success? Let me pause here. Imagine you're a consultant and you come out from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and you've been appointed to advise countries how to improve their education systems. You study their systems. What would you offer as initiatives? In Singapore in the 1960s, what would you have been your grand plan for Singapore? Just list in your mind four or five reasons that you would give or strategies 
and then let's see how it matches with what I think or the reasons that explain our success. So keep it in your mind and then we'll, we'll do a mental check as I go along this lecture. You got your four and five strategies in mind? You th why you think Singapore succeeded? Okay, here we go. Historically, it is important to appreciate that the high quality education system we, we have in place today was not a given. Singapore did not have the advantage of strong foundations. On the contrary, we inherited disparate systems with different modes of instruction and varying standards. When the first PSLE, the Primary School Leaving Examination, which our children take on age 12, was inaugurated in 1960, and when it was inaugurated, it was done in four languages, not one, not English. Only 45% passed. 55% failed the Primary 6 exam. Just imagine if you were Minister of Education then, and says, well, sir, I have good and bad news. 55% fail, but 45% pass. A book by Mr. Tan Yap Kwang, who was a past chief examiner of our Singapore exams, entitled Examinations in Singapore, Changes and Continuity, provides a succinct account. As a trading post with streams of migrant populations, Singapore had a mix of vernacular schools for each of the four large language groups. There were varying standards, different curricula, and they were subject to diverse influence from the countries of origin. A few English schools, English stream schools were set up, such as RI, Raffles Institution, Ganyang Singh, Uttram, and Victoria. They later became government schools, which are still with us today. Others were private schools founded by missionaries and community groups such as SGI and, and Anglo-Chinese School. These English stream schools were supported by a systematic organization of English medium examinations from the UK and had the most structured system of education. They were also favored by the government as promoted the language of the colonial administration. But only a small proportion of the population attended these schools. The majority of Chinese attended Chinese stream schools set up by the different dialect groups and clans. They were pro-China pro in outlook and syllabi and followed the China's 633 system, six years in primary school, Zhongxie, which was three years in middle school and then high school. These Chinese schools proliferated in the early 1900s and were fueled and politicized by exile reformers and revolutionaries from China. Graduates from this system, unfortunately, had no recognized qualifications or less recognized qualifications and found it hard to find jobs compared to those from English stream schools. Many became disgruntled and therefore easy targets for the communists. The Malay stream schools received more support from the government as it was thought that the learning of Malay languages would be useful to, to the acquisition of English language. Tamils, too, had their own vernacular schools, but generally few in number due to the small numbers. So for the better part of Singapore's history, educational standards were low. The curricula delivered by most schools under the colonial system was largely designed with the objective of staffing the lower ranks of the civil service. The proliferation of vernacular schools also made it difficult for the government to build a united and loyal citizenry let alone raise educational standards through a national curricula and mode of assessment. So as I said, you're the consultant. This is the state of affairs you inherited. What would you suggest? One entirely plausible scenario with this structure was that Singapore could have evolved into a stratified society based on the disparate school systems. It would have created tensions and fault lines as groups were exposed to different influences in their formative years. Other countries have gone that way and suffered damaging consequences. Fortuitously for us, we did not fall into that trap. And from the 1970s and 80s, fundamental and radical shifts would pull up our system. It would elevate our education system, but intrinsic to this process, it would also shape who and what we became as a nation. As in most things in life, trade-offs and consequences were part and parcel of momentous decisions. Let me now state what I think were the fundamentals that made this change. The first fundamental shift 
or the cornerstone of our educational system was the decision to use English as a medium of instruction in our schools. How many of you said English? Put up your hands. Not bad, about 20%. Earn your keep. You've earned your keep. Not bad, Kishore. 20% got it right, at least. Parents, given the choice of English, saw the practical benefits and opted for it in droves. The concept of globalization was nascent, and we would reap rich harvests as English became the lingua franca of an exploding information age to come. We did not envisage the magnitude of that change because these changes were made in the 60s and 70s. But when it came, it enabled us to leapfrog many nations and also allowed us to improve the teaching of maths and science and technologically based subjects. Ex post, the choice of English conferred that the choice of English conferred enormous advantages seems almost a no-brainer of a choice in today's context. But please recall that in the 1950s and 60s, Singapore was a very diverse collection of people. Our citizens had different languages and culture. We could have done what other countries did, which was to adopt the language of the majority race, Chinese, or adopt Malay as our official language, as we did, so that we could assimilate well with our neighboring countries we would be a very different Singapore today if we had made other choices. Let me illustrate that. Take Sri Lanka as a comparison. Sri Lanka citizens were adept English speakers when Sri Lanka was still a British colony. However, in the 1950s, with nationalism on the rise, the government replaced English with Singhalese, Singhalese as its official language. Today, English has been relegated to a third language after Tamil, and spoken by only 10% of the population. Successive governments have thought of reintroducing English, but unfortunately, it's not easy to turn back the clock. One Sri Lankan minister shared with me a few years ago that even if the government wanted to switch back to using English as a medium of instruction, it would take many years to train enough English-speaking teachers. Malaysia, too, offers lessons. Like Singapore, it started out with vernacular schools, which adopted each of the four language groups. In 1957, Bahasa Malayu was declared the sole national language and subsequently became the medium of instruction in all national schools. So very interesting contrast because we took divergent paths and very useful to study. However, in 2003, the government decided to switch to English in teaching maths and science, recognizing that this would be useful in preparing young Malaysians for the globalized world. Unfortunately and expectedly, implementation was not easy. A whole generation of young people, namely those who are in their mid-40s and younger, have grown up with Malay as their medium of instruction. It will take time for a large enough core of English teachers to be built up. This challenge is especially, especially acute in the rural areas where there is a shortage of English teachers. A report publicized by the Star in January last year indicated that many teachers were still hesitant to teach maths and science in English due to a lack of confidence and competency. East Timor is yet another interesting country, but it offers lessons in real time because it's ongoing. When it gained its independence in 1999, as you know, East Timor chose Portuguese, now only widely used in Brazil and Portugal, some parts of Africa and a declining group in Macau. Textbooks in that language are not easy to come by. And this is, of course, just a thought exercise. But would the trajectory of East Timor be different if it had chosen to emphasize English? Singapore chose that path. Not only did we choose English, but we started teaching it to our young as their first language. It has proven to be hugely beneficial for economic progress, but there are, of course, other consequences. Because the language that one uses to read, think, and speak, and interact also determines who we are as an individual. Collectively, the language environment shapes our national psyche and rubric and in some regards, our core values. Ensuing trends have become irreversible, I think. 
Our language environment has changed dramatically over the years. Let me give you one metric. In 1996, a third of primary one students came from homes when English was the main language. In other words, a third of the population spoke English at their homes. A decade later, in 2006, slightly more than half speak English at home. And I think this trend will continue. Our rigorous teaching and emphasis of English as a common working language has enabled young Singaporeans to be culturally adaptable to Western societies. Many of our young people who set foot into US or UK for the first time as university students quickly feel at home. They feel as if they don't really find it difficult to adjust the thoughts, the surroundings, the people, the society at large. Multinational companies tell us that they like to headhunt Singaporeans who can bridge the gap between East and West. With rising affluence in education, inevitably we will see an increasing number of Singaporeans who work, travel and live in other parts of the world. This easy adaptability to the larger world does obviously impact on the sense of rootedness here. Values and rootedness are transmitted powerfully through shared formative rituals and experiences within families and a broader community. And language is a rich medium intricately woven into these processes. The language and cultural milieu in childhood has far-reaching consequences that extend to adulthood. So when I speak to some of older Singaporeans, they're still counting Cantonese. I'm not sure which language you dream in, or whether you're bilingual in your dreams, but it's usually a language that was used in your formative years, in your childhood years. So they are deeply embedded in their psyche. Take Denmark as an example, where all children are first taught in Danish in preschool and early primary, and only start to learn English from the third grade or nine years old. So while they're able to speak English competently, the rootedness and the cultural milieu remains distinctively Danish. Some Asian countries too, like Taiwan, Thailand, and Hong Kong, start learning English later, and as a second language. If you observe what goes on in their restaurants and their retail outlets, it reveals insights into the social dynamics facilitated by the native language. So one Singaporean says he enjoys ordering a menu in a restaurant in Hong Kong because he can banter with the waitress. They can share jokes because it's the same language. And that social facilitation goes on. It cuts across socioeconomic class. We recognize the social consequences, but the teaching of English as our first language has gotten us where we are today. And I think you'll be very foolhardy to tinker with this. Our strong English competency will continue to provide us with a competitive edge, but yet at the same time, we must make the effort to evolve social norms and platforms that provide us with a greater sense of home and Singaporeanness. It's a challenge. We're a young country. We have time. We have resources, but we should pay extra effort. So first, English. The second cornerstone of our education system is the bilingual policy, where all students learn both English and their mother tongue. How many of you got that right? Bilingual policy. Hmm, less than 5%. So there may be some contention there. The bilingual policy reconciled the tensions between progressing into modernity through English against the loyalties to native language and customs from deep-seated communal ties. Bilingualism allowed each ethnic group to retain and touch their cultural lodestone. At a national level, it has helped our society embrace diversity because there are if you like, three mother tongue languages and other languages, and establish linkages to the world. Travelers here notice it. Recently, a royalty from the large Middle East country made official visits to this part of the world, skipped around the region. And at the end of this tour, he had two days for his leisure, R&R. &R. I didn't know that royalty had R&R, &R, but they do. Rest and recreation, in case you're wondering what the R&R &R is. His officials recommended Singapore was the last stop before his R&R. &R, and his officials recommended going somewhere else. But he reversed that decision. He told me he did so. 
and insisted on spending those few more days in Singapore. I asked, what did this wealthy, well-traveled royal, who could choose to be anywhere else, find appealing about Singapore? He put it simply, but powerfully when he said that he felt comfortable and welcomed here. No one gave him strange looks, whatever the garb. He also liked our green spaces and our friendly service. Our bilingual policy has also enabled us to plug into the rest of the world. Our institutes of higher learning have been able to form linkages of ease, not only with other institutions in English-speaking countries, but also with those in China, India, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Such alliances and partnerships are reaching new heights. With rising numbers, NTU has been holding its convocation for its China-based graduates in China for the past two years. They have enough. And when they gather in China, they come from the larger China. So it's quite a, a reunion. Even our primary and secondary schools have established strong networks with their international counterparts. Last year, more than 50,000 students from over 300 schools were involved in overseas programs. China and Malaysia were top destinations. But we must also accept that it will be increasingly difficult to maintain mother tongue language competencies as more speak English as their main language at home. So our teaching and testing of English and mother tongue language must evolve to respond to this new trend. Students have a finite capacity and it's not realistic to assume that they can master all things. The third cornerstone of our education system is streaming. Politically incorrect, but there you have it, streaming. How many of you got that right? Or agreed with me? Politically incorrect to raise your hands. <laughs> Singapore over owes a great debt of gratitude to Dr. Go King Sui for his report in 1978, which is commonly referred to as the Go Report. Where it would have been simpler to avoid hard truths, this report was underpinned by the fundamental belief that students had varying learning ability and would therefore be better off being grouped together to learn at their appropriate pace. The fundamentals of streaming. Put simply, streaming allows each child to better fulfill his inherent potential and I would add, actually helps the weaker academic students as shown by our TIMS results. Singapore today has reaped the benefits of that difficult transition I showed how even our weaker students are performing well by international standards earlier. Before streaming, only about a third of primary students progressed to secondary education, either because they dropped out or did not pass the PSLE. These higher levels of attrition still occur today in other systems that attempt to wallpaper the differences. For example, many researchers have highlighted a growing concern that up to one in three high school students in the U.S do not graduate. In contrast, in Singapore, with ability-based learning, almost all of each cohort stay in school and receive 10 years of education. And all graduates, whether from ITE, polytechnics and universities, receive high-quality education and are employable after graduation. And this is no mean feat by any yardstick. But of course, there are important caveats. Streaming must lead to better outcomes and be matched with adequate resources to help stretch each child to his maximum. It must not erode self-confidence or the belief that they cannot go further. It must reduce stigmas and labels. And this is why MOE has refined this policy to subject-based banding, as an example in primary schools. We also create many opportunities for late bloomers to move across to more advanced levels. Life teaches us that there are many variables beyond academic ability which determine who succeeds. Our education system should not say or teach otherwise. English and our bilingual policy and streaming created a stable framework which we could build a world-class education system. They were necessary and vital, but not sufficient. Two other critical components were quality teachers and school leaders, and yes, proverbially maligned exams or assessments. A report by McKinsey re released last year studied top performing education system. McKinsey asked a simple question. He just surveyed the world territory, again another facet of globalization, and said which are the top systems, and let me try to find the systems and the reasons. They concluded that quality teachers was the most important determinant of a quality education system. 
Passionate, competent, and caring teachers are the heart of the success of our education system. If you show me a weak education system anywhere, and we travel, we see many, and without exception, you will find as a cause an equally weak and demoralized teaching force, that our students do well, and that our standards are well regarded internationally, bears positive testament to the professionalism and commitment that exists in our teaching force. There are reasons why we have a top quality teaching force. We hire from the top one third of each of our cohorts. MOE hires one of every eight graduates of our publicly funded universities. That's a huge number, one in eight. And this is both sexes. But because we hire more women, I think we hire probably two of every five women who graduate. We have 29,000 teachers and believe in supporting them all along their journey when they join us as training teachers and beyond. And they have opportunities to upgrade for masters and doctoral study leave, and we provide them grants and loans. Besides good teachers' instruction counts, curriculum and pedagogy are nuts and bolts that secure the system, and we have a strong centralized system that oversees these essentials. And we have achieved enviable outcomes because good teachers teach well in classrooms. More senior and experienced colleagues share best practices while new teachers learn through observation and role models. Testing works. Empirically, I say this. Testing works. All top education systems set clear and high expectations for their students. We are no exception. Our strong assessment systems has produced students of high caliber. We also want our schools to be accountable for what they do, so we have self-evaluation as well as external audits. And where we find that students or schools are not performing to mark, we give them extra resources. So I gave five reasons. Let me summarize them. First, to social political considerations and the choice of English and the bilingual policy. And then putting into place sound educational fundamentals of good teachers, instruction, and streaming. These are the factors that maintain us on an even keel and we must keep each of these elements, but at the same time, we must also evolve our system to keep up with new challenges and structural trends. Let me briefly mention three broad directions that I think the education system in Singapore should move forward. Because we have progress, parents today are better educated and have more financial resources. The expectations for their children and their children's education will be much different compared to the expectations that their parents had of them. A child born today who will enter primary one in 2014 will be substantially different in upbringing and exposure compared to one who entered the same grade, say, 20 years ago. For future cohorts, one thing is certain, there will be greater expectations, and this itself is not negative. But it will mean more teachers to have higher qualifications, and having more teachers so that more time can be spent to develop each child, employing enough good teachers to support these expectations with a passion to teach and nurture will be a continuing challenge. If we want each child to have more attention, it must mean that we must empower principals and teachers to be able to develop each student under their care. And this necessarily means more autonomy for our schools, and this can only work if they're competent school leaders. Hence, our continual focus on attracting, developing, and retaining good teachers and school leaders. The second broad trend, we also see growing aspirations among Singaporeans. We recently announced the setup of a fourth publicly funded university, but we should explore more effective ways to help polytechnic and IT graduates upgrade in their working careers. A further three or four years of full-time education beyond their post-secondary education to achieve a degree cannot be the only and even preferred option. For many, this is high opportunity costs, as they are in great demand and eminently employable. Lifelong learning will be increasingly necessary as technology cycles shorten and knowledge and skills risk obsolescence. We should find ways and facilitate where possible more efficient ways to help them upgrade in a shorter period without having them to stop work altogether for long periods of time. The third broad shift beyond grades, values. One, sy one system, our system is one that is admired for having high averages. And I think 
we must maintain this academic rigor and continue our emphasis in maths and science. For a small country, it makes sense for our survival and continued prosperity, both as a nation and individually. But increasingly, we'll have to create space and structure to infuse our education system to impart values and not just grades to students. This has to keep in step as Singapore moves to a higher plane of actualization. We must respond to a more questioning younger population that may learn better through self-discovery and an exchange of views. But at the same time, we must find engaging ways to increase the sense of rootedness. We must help our young understand how Singapore of today has derived our core values. They can test these values, choose to reject them, and create new ones, and accept consequences of their own making. At the end of the journey in our education system, they must leave it with a sense of wholeness and preparedness and the desire to contribute to preserve, maintain and improve education and the lives of those around them. They must leave our education system confident of their self-worth and capable of being productive citizens. How do we move our system forward to place greater emphasis on these values beyond academic achievement? This is a challenge with no quick solutions, but leaders and principals in MOE feel deeply that this is the direction to take our education system forward, to better develop our children. We are mindful that mere wishing will not get us there, so we are carefully reviewing how this can be embedded into each school, how to impart values and maintain academic standards, and how both sets of achievements ought to be monitored. Let me conclude. Our education system has evolved over time in response to changing needs of our nation as well as to the external environment. We have a first-class education system that is respected internationally, but we can always do better. We want to maintain high educational standards that give every Singaporean student a valuable cachet and recognition worldwide. Moving forward, we want to create more space and focus in our system to impart values to our children. We want to nurture each child to believe in himself and to be self-sufficient, to care for his fellow men and to be able to contribute to the larger society around them. These are simple goals of any public education system, but few can say they have delivered. Singapore must aspire to attain these worthier educational goals. MOE will lead the way, but to succeed, we will need all stakeholders to support these initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Okay, we have an, roughly about 25 minutes or so to continue the conversation with the Minister. Uh, please start thinking of uh, your questions. Let me begin by asking you the first question, Minister. You know, among the um, achievements that Singapore has had in the educational field, one of the ones that really surprised me is how some public schools in, in America spontaneously, without any direction, began selecting mathematics textbooks written in Singapore for use in Singapore to be used in California and elsewhere. What, do you know what happened? How did that, that was a very surprising story. Well, um, how many of your children in, in schools now? <laughs> Have you tried them teaching them maths? They tell you the model method, right? Which you don't understand, and I don't understand either, but it works. We use algebra. Uh, they use graphic representations, and uh, but th that's just an example of how different it is. But on a larger point, if you look at the Tim score which I showed, you notice that uh, there are certain cultural and even ethnic biases for maths and science. Uh, maths and science are considered hard subjects. Clayton Christensen from Harvard Business School 
is on our uh, National Research Foundation, and he, he's written a book, and he's analyzed, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that book, but basically he shared a broad trend. He says, poor countries, first generation, poor countries, did well in maths and science. They were rigorous subjects, and the first generations always felt that that was the way out of poverty. And he's analyzed it, looked at across countries, and it seems to be a recurring trend. The second generation then says, well, let's go for the softer options. Uh, as he, he. So I think I'm not, I, I, my personal view is this is not a function of computing skills. I think inherently you do have it, but it is a function of being willing to sit down and, and do maths and science. Some people find it less interesting than others, generally speaking. So one is a generational change is tightly linked with, uh, with, with wealth levels. In terms of our instruction, I think that we have hit a sweet spot. We've somehow managed to find good teachers and master teachers who are very good at it. And some of the NIE research uh, is, is even taking us very far. So one of our researchers in INE actually studies MRI, MRI patterns. You know what MRI is? It's a magnetic re resonance of your brain, and he's doing functional MRI, which basically computes, which basically measures brain activity. And he gave, he tested different sets of students for the model method and algebra method, and found that they used less energy in the model method, and got the same right answers, of course. So, you ask me how we got here, uh, I don't really know. All I know is this is a virtuous place that we are in. We are having deep understanding about this now, and we should keep it. There's a great temptation now for, as a systems level, to say let's de-emphasize maths and science, which I think would be a great mistake. I don't think we should have hubris in our system. We are a small country, and we should keep the edge as long as we can. I don't know how we, we can do this. If universities responded to students' aspirations and first applications, I suspect about 30% to 40% will be business, and maybe maths and science, 20%. But as it is, we keep our systems where 50% is engineering, maths and science, IT. And I think that's a sensible system for now, and for as long as we can keep it. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Please come to the mic. Um, identify yourself briefly. Pose a short and sharp question. Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> Please go ahead, yes. Um, good afternoon, sirs. Um, I'm Mr. I'm Yo Jatin from the MPP 2008 program. I'm just a uh, fresh entered. Um, here's a question for Dr. A, Dr. Ng. Um, you mentioned that in a few future we are moving towards um, building up capacity, uh, better instruction for students and the key, the way forward is to have uh, more teachers and greater autonomy for schools. However, I also noticed that um, current results that we have as for example uh, as shown by the Tim score is actually underpinned by a substantial um, private education sector in Singapore, in other words, the private tutors. Right? This is something I've observed in my... Um, okay, to be honest, I was a teacher for the past three years. <laughs> so I have actually first-hand you know, experience with this thing. Right? So even now, I have students coming forward and asking me, oh, um, Mr. Yo, can you give me private tuition? You know, even though I'm supposed to have resigned. So I find it very... Um, it's kind of like indictment on our education system as to why our public education policy cannot cater sufficiently for the students we have. And what are your thoughts and possible solutions for this problem? Thank you. Thank you. I, um, first, uh, um, the assertion that the um, tuition helps maintain standards, uh, it's, it's a sensible one. I think that's probably true. But let me address the larger point. If you remember the slide on the TIMS, the countries that did well were mainly Asian countries, Japan, Korea, etc. Uh, just like 
uh, in many cultures where mothers press their children to study hard, uh, it also seems to have results. And it's not peculiar to us. I mean, our institution is just a manifestation of their great emphasis to want to go ahead. Uh, coincidentally, there was an article today at New York Times, and I just picked it up, and it was called A Taste of Failure Fuels an Appetite for Success in South Korea's Cram Schools. And this, these are cram schools in Korea, let me quote to you. On this regimented campus, miles from the nearest publication, public transportation, Mingju and the classmates cram from 6.30 a.m. to past midnight seven days a week to clear the fearsome hurdle that can decide their future, the National College entr Entrance Examination. Mingju, do your best, fighting, Mr. Chung shouted as his daughter disappeared into the building. Mingju turned around and raised the clenched fist. Fighting, she shouted back. Mm -hmm. Koreans say their obsession to get their children to top-notch universities is nothing short of a war. It's ingrained, it's deep in our psyche. Whether it's related to our 5,000 history as a Chinese population that revered the scholar class, I don't know. Should we dismantle it? Systematically? Should we pass a law and a legislation, no tuition allowed? <laughs> no studying beyond 9 p.m. <laughs> Next question, please. Um, yeah. uh, okay, we start the lady and the gentleman, and then uh, Dr. Tan Tenson. Please go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Angeline. I'm a mother of two kids, one in P3, one in Sec1. That puts one. me on very dangerous territory. <laughs> uh, I'm also, uh, how, how old are your kids again? Uh, one in P3, she's nine, one in Sec1. She just cleared the PSLE hurdle last year, thank goodness. Um, I'm also an MPA student, just started class, so I'm joining my kids in um, studying and homework. Uh, basically, as a mum, okay, this is it. I'm very passionate about education. I've also spent many years with IHLs. I was with NTU and SMU previously working with them. Now, my question really is this. Um, I believe strongly in our education system. We have done very well. But one of the things I find is that it's a very KPI-driven environment. Schools are measured. They have many goals to meet uh, in order to get funding. Now, one of the things I'm asking is, this, does this whole very KPI intense environment skew the way schools are managed? Uh, for example, my P3 kids start supplementary lessons. All right, so after their normal teaching, they stay back for ad additional classes twice a week. Uh, the other way is also about ECAs. It's supposed to be something students enjoy, but because they are given awards in niche areas, uh, schools with niche areas only want the best students to come into those ECAs. So a child who is not as competent but loves the sport will never get a chance to participate. So what are your views on that? Does MOE intend to try and shift that slant in that area? Thank you. Those are, are good questions and, and very cogent um, observations uh, that many parents share. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum and we have to fill it with something else if we want to get there. So the quick answer is yes, I think we should move. Uh, we need to rebalance the education system so that we can maintain the academic rigor, as I said, and yet at the same time create space and structure. I crafted it carefully, space and structure for the daily life of that school to do these other aspects, impart values. Um, you asked the question, the KPIs and testing. And it's interesting that many school systems have gone a full circle. At some point, some other systems went away from that. They went away from testing assessments to, to the more uh, environmental uh, disposition, creating awareness, self-actualization, internal motivation. 
after many, many years, struggled and said, well, it doesn't work. Let's go back to testing because testing works. So I think that's that the question, at least for now, is generally agreed that testing works and testing in a generic sense. We will have to also use that tool to measure schools in qualitative aspects. For example, we could ask teachers to tell us, has the confidence of your child increased? Can you measure it? Can you show us some measure? Or we could measure it. What is one strength that you have developed in this child? What are programs in place? What skills do you teach? So when I talked on this whole issue, and if you don't do that, you will find that nature calls a vacuum and other things take up that space you created. And in Singapore, I suspect the other things would be just more studying, more CCA, because you're guilty too. I'm not you. I mean, parents are guilty too. If we teach less, but they study more of the same to, to do to get ahead. So I think you have to do this. Mere wishing won't get us there. You have to build in systems. And at the end of the day, you are still very much dependent on principals and teachers who can use that time, teachable moments, but we also must find some way of systemically measuring this, putting in programs that will help us move towards there. So there are no quick fixes, but we'll move it there. And as I said, I think parents also have to understand the, the value of a more holistic education and must also reinforce that. Uh, because now I have parents complaining to me, why is my child doing so much CCA? I want my child to study that more. <laughs> and you have to have a buy-in. I think we're doing well. I don't think you want to reduce the academic rigor. It doesn't make sense. But at the same time, let's create space for that. So I think that's the direction, and I agree. That's where we want to head. Or you have to put it into the system. Thank you. Gentlemen over there, then. Jefferson over there. Um, th thank you for coming, Minister, today to address us. Um, I, my background in Irish education, and Ireland obviously is a country of four million, very, very similar to Singapore. And while we do all right in the uh, international rankings, we're not as high as Singapore, and we're always trying to, to get to your levels. The only thing that, the only criticism, however, that the Irish educationists have of the Singapore system is they say somewhat it stifles creativism a bit. I am just wondering, is that a, a concern for the government? Would you say that's a fair assessment? Do you have any safeguards to, to stop that, or do you have any initiatives to increase the creativism of your students? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, res I admire your Irish system very much. I visit many times, and he's right. Uh, for you, who you imagine Ireland as probably the same population as Singapore, but about 100 times bigger. That would be about right. Uh, and the structures are very similar. If you have an EDV, they have an equivalent there. And so we usually compare systems. Um, your question is a, a very timely one. Do systems, and let me take it a broader, the Asian style of education, if there's such a thing, and if you can agree that there's such a thing, stifle creativity. And the Olympics is a very opportune time to talk about that, <laughs> the opening ceremony. Uh, the Olympics has caused people to re-examine their fundamental assumptions. Uh, David Brooks recently, if you read the IHT yesterday, talked about this. And that basically, it was, I thought it was slightly too simplistic, but basically the argument was that the West, great proponents of individualism, great entrepreneurship, innovation, as compared to the Chinese and use the Olympics, precision, collectivism. And when you saw those drums, the precision. So, is there a single measure of creativity? Is the individual, individualistic route the only way to get there? I am not sure. I asked our own Singaporean students, and we have about 100 over or more in Cornell, and these are top performing ones. 
And for the, I asked them the same question. I said, you know, people say this of us. What's your own sense after being in Cornell, studying, and you come from RJC, HJC, ACJC, and, and the top colleges? And he says, this was a second year student, and he said to me, well, for exams, no big deal, we will ace it. But when lecturers give us a question that's de novo, yes, the Americans do think better on their feet, quicker. So are there trade-offs? Perhaps. And the lecturers also tell me the same thing. They say, we love your students, as I told you. They come so well prepared. First and second years, they breeze through. Uh, I think necessarily there might be some trade-offs, but I'm not sure whether there's too much of a generalization. Inherently, in, in producing systems, though, you must accept trade-offs. I think it would be very wise to. So if you look at TIMS, the results, I, I pay very close attention to the variance, how tight our scores are. Not only at the peaks, the median, but how tight our scores are. And to get that, teachers tell me to help a weak, a academically weaker student. How do you do it? Let's say in maths and science. Do you teach them the theory of mathematics? They don't. They drill them. They teach them, you know, this is the way you do it. You know, and they do better. Is that wrong? I'm not sure. So, I think there are not quite deterministic answers. Uh, I think none of us, or at least for myself, I, I try to keep an open mind and understand the limitations of choices and where the general directions that we want to move and yet still create enough space for schools, for parents, for different influences to move our system forward. I think that's a more sensible model rather than to say this is the right way, this is what I think, this is the right pedagogy, because that really confines outcomes. Uh, my name is Tan Tiam Soon. I'm from National University of Singapore. Um, my question is actually related to the last two questions in some way. Uh, we recognize from all the different surveys and all the trends that we have very, very high average. Uh, I, I recall looking at ACSI, IB data this year, ACSI is probably 1% of the entire IB cohort in the world of about 27,000. And 45% of the top student full perfect grade come from ACSI alone, out of 1% cohort. The question is, ultimately at the end of it, are these students going to be able to achieve peaks? And I think with the way uh, we are moving up the competitive ladders, uh, high average may no longer be enough. For a number of reasons, I think other countries are also beginning to learn some of what we have done well and imitating it. Perhaps their political system may not fully allow them to adapt what we have done, but they are moving in that direction. So the ability to now create peak of excellence is so critical. Unfortunately, peak of excellence often you cannot uh, 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 tell a priori where are they going to happen. It often comes in the most unexpected way, in most unexpected area. So I just want to hear what's your thoughts on how we're going to create some of this peak of excellence for the future generation. Thank you. Structurally, I think you're correct. Uh, in, in the U.S., for example, is a very clear example. The peaks of excellence in Stuyvesant High or, or, or Brooklyn High or Stuyvesant, where they have many Nobel Prize laureates that come from their schools. So in other words, they are the best of schools and sometimes not schools that are not very high standards. And there's basically an aggregation of confluence of factors with teachers uh, well-performing students that bring up their peak. But a public education sector, as I said, by definition, is measured by a medium. It has to be. And people, that's the public expectation. So when we rolled out the IT initiatives, we had to roll it out for all schools because equity and equal opportunity was a, was a key consideration. MOE, another, let me give you another example. I, I said I have 29,000 teachers. 
I don't send my teachers who graduate from top universities to the best schools disproportionately. Many are sent to so-called weaker schools. So I think as the main strategy to bring up the standard of high averages is a sensible policy. At the same time, I agree with you, you must create these peaks. And that's why we have the NS, NUS School of Maths and Science. We have uh, different avenues where they can peak. And within our school systems, we also have programs. But we have to manage that expectation against or the desire against the expectation of the general public. So while Singaporeans by and large accept the gifted education program, if you like, uh, there are of course undercurrents, issues of equity, issues of, of, of disproportionate resources. And they're not questions that easily will be resolved by policy. So as a sensible way, I agree with you, keep your averages high so that no child is denied a good education because of affordability, that in every school they have access to facilities, and yet create other opportunities for outliers, if you like, in the system at both ends. I would say at both ends, both in the top performing and those who have special needs to, to get attention so that they can reach a potential. I think if we can achieve that, then it's a very well-rounded system. We've reached 12.30, but can you take two more questions, Minister? The last two questions. Why don't we take them together? Go ahead. You first, followed by the lady. Yeah. Hi, afternoon. Um, I'm Wilson from the MPP course. Um, just now you mentioned self-actualization as one of the goals uh, in the future, beyond the actual concrete subject. So I think it's quite a noble goal. But then that necessitates greater civil liberties. When, when your citizens are more self-actualized, they want more freedom of expression and autonomy. So would that be counter to the interests of a strong government? Do you see a way to reconcile, reconcile this um, in terms of society, the government, and education co-evolving in a different dynamics? Because if you don't reconcile this, what I see is, for example, um, I was gifted and I was in RI, and there was a lot of self-actualization in my education. But a lot of my peers, they're finding um, government a bit stifling here. So people like that would be finding that they are able to, if they are mobile, they'll be able to go overseas instead. So would that be counter to the interest again of your yeah, yeah, You found it stifling? No, that, that's why I'm back here. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I just want to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of my peers, they would choose to stay overseas. So how would you reconcile that with the policies? Thank you. Do you want to take the next question? Yes. Or, okay, please go ahead. The next question, yes. yes. Hi, I'm Marianne from Denmark. The only thing we had in common in the five points for a better education system was the better teachers, which is, in fact, a large problem back in Denmark. And I was surprised by how you managed to get the best students to become teachers. Do you pay them more? Uh, what are the incentives? That's, that's what we're troubling with in Denmark It's right a very now. relevant question. I can't do anything without good teachers. Let me answer that question first. Uh, the McKinsey report, uh, if you're interested, you should look at it, which studied that question and they compared systems, starting salaries. Uh, we, have, we don't pay the highest. South Korea, by the way, we hire from the top one-third of our cohort. South Korea gets them from the top 5%. And they pay them very well. Uh, starting pay is important, but it's not the key criteria. It's progression and career prospects. So you ought to have a system where teachers are uh, allowed to teach. In some systems, uh, principals feels hampered because, you know, for whatever reasons, they can't maintain standards. So strong leadership and autonomy is also an important one. Uh, there are many factors, and, and I think the McKinsey report is, is a good place to start. But that's, that's, you're quite right, that's the place that we have to begin if we want to deliver good education. Um, we try to benchmark our salaries. Uh, we, don't, we can't afford to pay them as high as lawyers or doctors, but they're somewhere there. But more importantly, I think it's also um, time for them to upgrade, as I say, masters and doctors. Then we recently introduced a new initiative for them to refresh themselves. 
So after teaching for X number of years, they are given, say, three or four weeks for work attachment programs where they choose to go. There was a particular teacher that taught home economics, food nutrition. She was in her 50s. And she chose to work in, um, I think it was Delhi, France, or Pizza Hut, for those three weeks. I said, why do you choose Pizza Hut? She says, well, you know, I want, I've been teaching this, and I wanted to know what the real life out there so I can tell my students. I, said, I got burnt, and you know, I got, I got, but it was a good learning experience. And they come back refreshed with, 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 with new, new insights. And so I think you have to have, you have to pay special attention. The first question, how do you reconcile civil liberties and uh, self-actualization? Thank you. Um, well, I don't know how to answer um, uh, vicarious assertions. Uh, in other words, I, because every time I speak to someone who asserts that, he always says that he's speaking for somebody else. So I assume in your case, uh, you were never stopped from saying anything you wanted to. And let's be honest, the net is so open, there's nothing that you, you want to say that you cannot say on the net, except for racist comments, which we take a firm view in Singapore. And, but, you know, all of us block, uh, no, all of us go into blocks mm -hmm. from time to time. You don't have a block of your own? I don't have a block. <laughs> I, I tell my children, you're a narcissistic generation. Who is interested in what you do? But, <laughs> <laughs> but they laugh at me. <laughs> but there's, you know, so I, there's a slight mismatch between that perception and the reality. There's nothing that you want to say that cannot be said. And I'm not sure, though, that you want <clears> to make a direct correlation with that kind of environment and actualization. I happen to think the actualization for Singaporeans is actually to be more open, not, not necessarily just as they perceive it in the political sphere, but even in their, their business spheres and their social activities, you know, to create more platforms. I, I think they have to look beyond into ASEAN, for example. That's a very interesting mode. And that's what we're doing. So our school children now are partnering and going every year to schools in China, in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Indonesia. And they come back with great reflections, young children. So I'm excited that we, will, we are bringing up a, a very regionally aware, conscious, younger population that may surprise us all with you know we we have pigeonholed and labels that we can't break out of i think the young will tell us very very different things and i think that's exciting for us well minister you know people ask me why is the lee kuan yew school of public policy growing so fast i say there are many reasons but one of them frankly is the attraction of singapore's public policies we provide one of the best public policy laboratories in the world and you've already demonstrated today in the field of education, the excellence we have achieved clearly is a great magnet uh, for the rest of the world. So in, that, in so doing, I think you're also responsible for why the school is growing, growing so fast. <laughs> uh, with that, I hope you'll join me now in uh, thanking the minister for his address. And before concluding, uh, please remember that the students and staff, and I'm sure there's enough food as well for members of the public who want to join in, at the foyer of the Wee Tiong Ham building, there's lunch waiting for students and staff to now. Please join me in thanking the minister. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.